Arriving in Pittsburgh for the G20 summit are finding a city on lockdown. The next moment, my eardrums were blasting, and as that happened, I basically turned around, saw now 40 riot police assisted by military. They're closing in. Run! Get out! I told you! This is why police save us life! You must leave the this was the talk of the town in Hardin on Thursday. Mercedes decked out in the city of Hardin Police Department decals and driven by American Police Force members. We're not disclosing the name of our parent company. We know the guy that owns the company, but we've never seen this name before. Excuse me, you just dropped a bomb on us. This is Red Dawn, foreign mercenary group admitted. Driving around doing police work with Hardin Police next to their American Police Force logos. This is insane. So he's a controlled asset, and of course it's not a matter of failure to connect the dots. The FBI now has five versions of their story. Can you add how they were all beginning in Yemen? That's how it worked. And the scanning machines that we currently are beginning to deploy. He told me to go through the scanner, and I said no. It's a real act of submission. They were involved in a cover-up. This is huge. The Federal Emergency Management Agency coordinates the federal government's role in preparing for, preventing, mitigating the effects of, responding to, and recovering from all domestic disasters, whether natural or man-made, including acts of terror. Its beginnings can be traced to disaster legislation passed in 1803 to provide assistance to a New Hampshire town following a fire. Following a string of natural disasters in the 60s and 70s, 
President Jimmy Carter signed Executive Order 12127 and merged nearly 10 federal agencies into what we now know as FEMA. In March 2003, FEMA joined 22 other federal agencies to become part of Homeland Security. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast and most notably the city of New Orleans. Federal and local authorities encouraged those who could not evacuate the city to go to the Superdome to ride out the storm, where there would be assistance to take care of them. This is how your government cares for you. This is a FEMA camp. And that's all we're hearing about are the people in New Orleans. Those are the only ones that we're seeing on television are the scumbags who were left in New Orleans or who decided to stay in New Orleans and they're getting all of the attention. I have made three police state films. I have uh, also, you know, written books and, and uh, uh, news articles on the subject. And the problem is, when you cover FEMA camps, is there's so much evidence, so many congressional hearings, so many news articles, so many documents. You know, the problem is knowing where to start. Executive orders. This is how they introduce you. See, they're introducing it all. They've denied they're building all this for all these decades. Now as they unveil it, they're putting their PR spin on it. So Executive Order 10,990 allows the government to take over all modes of transportation and control of highways and seaports. That's been reaffirmed under PDD 51, under the John Warner Defense Authorization Act and others. Executive Order 10,995 allows the government to seize and control the communication media. Executive Order 10,997 allows the government to take over all electrical power, gas, petroleum, fuels, and minerals. Executive Order 10,998 allows the government to seize all means of transportation, including personal cars, trucks, and vehicles of any kind, and total control over all highways, seaports, and waterways. Executive Order 10,999 allows the government to take over all food resources and farms. Executive Order 11,000 allows the government to mobilize civilians into work brigades under government supervision. Executive Order 11,001 allows the government to take over all health, education, welfare functions. What's happening through the imploded economy that the foreign central banks are engineering? Do they make you be beholden to the government? Designates the Postmaster General to operate a national registration of all persons. That goes on through the Selective Service. Executive Order 11003 allows the government to take over all airports, aircraft, including commercial aircraft. Remember when they shut down all flights after 9-11? Executive Order 11004 allows the Housing and Finance Authority to relocate communities, build new housing with public funds, designate areas to be abandoned, and establish new locations for populations. Remember Louisiana, Mississippi, Katrina? Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. The FEMA director is working 24 Executive Order 11005 allows the government to take over all railroads, inland waterways, and public storage facilities. Executive Order 11051 specifies the responsibility of the Office of Emergency Planning and gives authorization to put all executive orders into effect in times of increased international tensions and economic or financial crises. Executive Order 11310 grants authority of the Department of Justice to enforce the plans set out in executive orders to institute industrial support, to establish judicial and legislative liaison, to control all aliens, to operate penal and correctional institutions, and to advise and assist the president. So that's your FEMA camps. Executive Order 11049 assigns emergency preparedness functions to federal departments and agencies, consolidating 21 operational executive orders issued at 15-year period. Executive Order 11921 allows the Federal Emergency Preparedness Agency to develop plans to establish control over the mechanisms of production and distribution of energy sources, wage salaries, credit, and the flow of money in U.S. financial institution in any undefined national emergency. It also provides that when a state of emergency is declared by the President, Congress cannot review the action for six months. PDD-51 says never.
up on screen are photocopies of the Miami Herald, and this goes back into the 1980s, when they had congressional hearings dealing with shadow government and martial law. There's the headline, the secret government. And it talks about secret summits, a plan to take over the government. Uh, and it shows the people that were in charge of the continuity of government, Dick Cheney and others. And then we have a congressional hearing where we have Congressman Jack Brooks and others during Iran-Contra bringing up the secret plans, and they're told by Congressman Inouye that that can't be discussed. It's a national security issue. In the 1980s, the concentration camp program got a big boost. Colonel North, in your work at the uh, NSC, were you not assigned at one time to work on plans for the continuity of government in the event of a major disaster? Mr. Chairman. I believe that question touches upon a highly sensitive and classified area. So may I request that you not touch upon that, sir? I was particularly concerned, Mr. Chairman, because I read in Miami papers and several others that there had been a plan uh, developed by that same agency, a contingency plan in the event of emergency that would suspend the American Constitution. And I was deeply concerned about it and wondered if that was the area in which he had worked. May I most respectfully request that that matter not be touched upon at this stage. If we wish to get into this, I'm certain arrangements can be made for an executive session. And tragically, the only member who got close was Jack Brooks, and he was stopped by the chairman. But the truth of the matter is that, yes, you do have those standby provisions, and the plans are there, and the statutory uh, emergency plans are there, whereby... Uh, you could, in the name of uh, stopping terrorism, apprehend, invoke the military, and uh, arrest Americans and hold them in detention camps. Throughout history, criminals get control of governments. They use phony crises to enslave the public. And they're taking your pension funds. They're taking your money. They're raising the taxes on you. They are going to squeeze the daylights out of us all. And that's why they're geared up for martial law and to take the media over. Because this is quite a gamble by the establishment. You know, we should have grand juries indicting the bankers and having them turn states' evidence against each other. And this whole criminal shadow government, national security state, should be exposed. Everything it's engineered and bring in total tyranny and start arresting people for their speech. So it either goes into tyranny or into liberty. And believe me, folks, liberty is probably where it's going because this tyranny is so horrible, they've got planned. Let's go ahead and go to Congressman a year and a half ago on the Homeland Security Board wanting to know about PDD-51. Now, this fight went on for a year. The cover sheet of Presidential Decision Directive 51 stated the president's a dictator. Congress has no power during any emergency, including economic. So now Congress isn't involved in continuity of government when Congress is co-equal to the president and the courts. In fact, the Founding Fathers said Congress was above the courts and the president, but then later courts said, no, they're equal. Now they're saying they're not. Okay? Because it's harder for a dictator to take control in the Congress because there's 500 people separation of powers. The president is where your main dictator will come from, so it's the weakest. It follows the orders of Congress and then executes those orders. But then the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee said, I am co-equal with the president in national security. Let me see PDD-51. And they were told no. But the cover sh sheet alone states the president's a dictator. Then we see last year PDD-51 being executed and members of Congress, Senator Inhofe and others being told martial law will be declared if you don't hand total control and immunity over to the banks. And they followed orders and did it. So the martial law is now in place. And with that comes the FEMA camps. Will we get to that place? Not if we expose it. But we're already got our neck in the noose here. Is the executioner going to pull the lever? I don't know.
Uh, let's continue with uh, the congressman talking about PDD 51. Most Americans would agree that it would be prudent to have a plan to provide for the continuity of government and the rule of law in case of a devastating terrorist attack or natural disaster. A plan that provide for the cooperation, the coordination, and continued functioning of all three branches of the government. The Bush administration tells us they have such a plan. They in introduced a little sketchy public version that's clearly inadequate uh, and, and doesn't really tell us what they have in mind. But they said, don't worry, there's a detailed classified version. But now they've denied the entire Homeland Security Committee of the United States House of Representatives access to their so-called detailed plan to provide for continuity of government. They say, trust us. Trust us, the people who brought us Katrina to be competent in face of a disaster. Trust us, the people who brought us warrantless wiretapping and other excesses eroding our civil liberties. Trust us. Maybe the plan just really doesn't exist and that's why they won't show it to us. I don't know. Or maybe there's something there that's outrageous. The American people need their elected representative to review this plan for the continuity of government. All right, that's Congressman Peter DeFazio. Now, that was a year and a half ago. Uh, Mr. DeFazio, the cover sheet says the president's a dictator and that Congress has no authority over continuity of government. That's why they're now saying Congress can't see it, because they're declaring and executing that power. Now, we fast forward a year plus to October 3rd, and here is Congressman Sherman, who we interviewed here on air, other congressmen we interviewed, and Senator Inhofe, saying they marched in and told him, martial law will be declared if you don't do this. So, so, so we go from the 80s to where don't talk about the martial law plans in the FEMA camps. Uh, if you want to know about that, you can know about it in executive session, Congressman Jack Brooks, to, oh, Congress, you're not allowed to see the plans now. To Congress, do what we say, we're under martial law. The only way they can pass this bill is by creating and sustaining a panic atmosphere. That atmosphere is not justified. Many of us were told in private conversations that if we voted against this bill on Monday, that the sky would fall, the market would drop two or three thousand points the first day, another couple thousand the second day, and a few members were even told that there would be martial law in America if we voted no. That's what I call fear-mongering. So we have the congressman on with us. We only have him for five minutes, five, six minutes. Uh, congressman Brad Sherman, thank you for coming on, sir. Good to be with you. You know, Wall Street used uh, these uh, panic uh, tactics to get us to pass this $700 billion. Uh, well, what the bill really is is $700 billion in unmarked bills. They said the market would drop by 4,000 points, blood would flow in the streets, and uh, lions would be devouring children in the parks of Los Angeles. Now that the bill has passed, our economy is still going to be very bad. The bailout money so far has been set aside to buy shares in banks, $250 billion, $40 billion to AIG, and $60 billion yet to be committed, leaving the remaining $350 billion for future use. We've, uh, we've got to do everything we can to focus people's attention on this bill as it's carried out because uh, it allows Paulson to go up to Wall Street. He can give money to one uh, firm. He cannot return phone calls from another firm. Uh, he can uh, uh, take, he, he, he can, if he want, finds out uh, which firms are donating to the 527 organizations which take secret contributions and then make political advertising. He can look at the RNC donor list. He can do anything he wants. Let's go back to what you said on the floor in the last 24 hours about members of Congress. And I've talked to some. They're, they're afraid to even come on and talk about it, being told there will be martial law in America and we'll just do this with or without you if you don't do this. That is incredible. And I just had the former head of the Treasury on earlier, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts from Reagan, had a policy saying that this, this gives them economic martial law. Is that not terrorism? Is it, I mean, is not the definition to threaten harm or carry out harm for a political aim, sir? Well, but keep in mind, we passed the bill, and I'm told the market is down. Sir, here's the $64 million question. You and other members of Congress say, yeah, well, there were some people threatening martial law, but we don't 
you know, you know, think they meant it. They were just trying to to fearmonger, which I call mm -hmm. terrorism, into it. That's a huge issue. Specifically, sir, we need to know names. Who told you that they were told that uh, martial law and blood in the streets, as you said, what happened? Private conversations between members on the floor. You, you really can't reveal without the, the permission of the other uh, I understand, but were there arm twisters coming up or were they scared? I mean, how was it said specifically? What we have to do is expose those circumstances where we're bailing out a particular firm and how many of the executives at that firm are continuing to make a million dollars a year, five million dollars a year, twenty million dollars a year. There's going to be a lot of information that is not public and it's going to take investigative reporters to find out things that congressmen can't find out and that the public is not going to be aware of. You know, I have to, I have to go right now, but uh, it's been a pleasure being with you. Somebody in D.C. was feeding you guys quite a story prior to the bailout, a story that if we didn't do this, if we didn't do this, we were going to see something on the scale of the, uh, of the Depression. We were t there were people that were talking about, um, you know, martial law being instituted, uh, civil unrest, all these kinds of stuff. Who was feeding you this information? That's Henry Paulson. We had a uh, conference call early on. It was on a Friday, I think uh, a week and a half before this the vote on October 1st. So it would have been the middle, what was it, 19th, the 19th of September, okay. we had a, a conference call. Uh, in, in this conference call, and I, I guess there's no reason that, for me not to repeat what he said, but he, he painted this picture you just described. He said, this is serious. This is the most serious thing that we face. It's far going to be far worse than the Great Depression of the 30s. And uh, all these things, he was very descriptive of exactly what would happen if, if we didn't buy mm -hmm. out these toxic assets, okay. which he abandoned the, the day after he got the money. Okay, here's our top story. Obama signed this seven days ago on January 11th, 2010. And I spent a few days reading over it, checking the U.S. code, checking the laws that it mentions, and it ties into Presidential Decision Directive 51 signed by Bush. And remember, Congress wanted to get the full Presidential Decision Directive and accompanying executive order. Would be prudent to have a plan to provide for the continuity of government and the rule of law in case of a devastating terrorist attack. The Bush administration tells us they have such a plan, but now they've denied the entire Homeland Security Committee of the United States House of Representatives. And Bush declared national security and wouldn't even let Homeland Security Committee, which is supposedly co-equal with the president, wouldn't even let them have access to it. Uh, but the cover sheet stated that for any emergency, including economic, anywhere in the world, that the executive is over the legislative and judicial, over the courts, over the Congress, which is unconstitutional, it's supposed to have separation of powers. The people aren't supposed to be divided, what the government always tries to do. The government's supposed to be divided so that you can't ever get a dictatorship. Well, this is what the founders said. This is what America is. It's why we love the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So President Bush signed this National Security Directive, and it says the continuity of government program will enhance the credibility of our national security posture and enable more rapid, effective response and recovery, and it goes on. The catastrophic emergency means any incident, regardless of location in the world, that results in extraordinary levels of mass casualties, damages, or disruption severely affecting the U.S. population, infrastructure, environment, economy, or government functions. And under this, the president is over the governors, he's over the legislatures of the states, he's over the Congress, and Congress has no authority. And then Congress asked for the full secret document, and it's still classified to this day. Obama has continued breaking his promise of transparency and has not released the full text of this and other memorandum. Connected into this is his new announcement. His new announcement. He is creating, with this executive order titled Establishment of the Council of Governors, it says here in the document that they are taking the governors, the states, uh, the police forces, everything under the control of NORTHCOM, that's the Pentagon, and Homeland Security. But don't worry, the states have their say. The president is going to appoint the 10 members 
five governors from the Republican and five governors from the Democrats. Kind of like Bush called the 9-11 Commission uh, independent when he appointed it, or Janet Reno appointed her own Waco investigation team. This would be like Hitler uh, appointing his own Nuremberg judges. I mean, it, it's or, or Al Capone at his own uh, court case. I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And there it is at WhiteHouse.gov, the executive order for anyone uh, that wishes uh, to see that for themselves. Separately, I have the Rand Corporation's plan that they uh, put out last year. And this plan, the Stability Police Force of the United States, justification options for creating U.S. capabilities. This has already been implemented covertly in the last 15 years. But now they're just being open about it. And it has all the maps here of how uh, Stability Police Force headquarters to run your local city, they have uh, systems for medium-sized police forces, uh, large police forces. They have the stability unit for small police units. Again, communist Russia had this. Communist China has this. Russian news is freaking out, saying America gets its own Politburo. On the Richter scale of tyranny, this is about a 10. And it goes back, because now all these conservative groups are going, oh my gosh, it's martial law. Oh, my gosh, you know, Obama's having a big power grab. And yes, he is. But Obama is just the teleprompter reading minion or front man, just like Bush was. He's just better than Bush was at it. It is the system that's doing this. Big central banks threatened martial law in early October of 2008. If the trillions, not 700 billion, but trillions of dollars, the overriding issue is we are under martial law right now. In... 1986, under Rex 84, they opened 12 secret army camps to test if they could keep them secret while they held federal. Now they hold state prisoners as well. Federal prisoners would then be given a few years off their sentence if they agreed to not tell family about it and to go to the labor camps. It is a labor camp, and under the uh, revised military rules, it allows any U.S. citizens to be put in it under forced labor. Uh, here is the Civilian Inmate Labor Camp Program Army Regulation 210-35. It's exactly 30 pages long. I suggest you Google Civilian Inmate Labor Camp Program. Even if you don't have a computer, go to the library. This is important. Now, this is the big piece of news. This is to establish setting up prison labor camps, negotiations with correctional systems representing Representatives to establish prison camps, governing criteria, civilian inmate labor camps, policy statement, governing provisions for operating civilian inmate prison camps on Army installations, procedures for establishing a civilian inmate prison camp on Army installations, infrastructure, inter-service, inter-agency, and inter-departmental support agreements, working with local police at the FEMA camps. In 2002, I published my book, Descent into Tyranny. I've been covering it since 97 when it was declassified, but I put it in my book, Descent into Tyranny. This sucker was set up in 1986 at 12 camps. It's since doubled to 24. And from 86 to 97, secretly at labor camps, U.S. citizens, non-military uh, prisoners, were worked on FEMA camps. Now, this was beta testing. They would tell them, you'll be given leniency and only serve half your sentence if you agree to labor. The minute you don't, you'll be sent back on these military bases, but you can't tell anybody national security. See, they were testing, can we keep camp secret from local police or get them to work with us? Can we keep camp secret from the media? So for 11 years, they kept this sucker secret. Reagan, Bush, Clinton. And then Clinton declassifies it and says it's a good thing in 97, and they double the number. We had secret copies of this when I first got on air in about 95, 96, with just the cover sheet of it, and people made fun of us and didn't believe it. Then it was declassified. This is from Army.mil. So here it is, the big kahuna. This is just one section of these, training the troops, training the infrastructure, creating the larger cadres to expand the archipelago of gulags. New legislation authorizes FEMA camps in the United States.
and it says six major camps across the country with hundreds of sub-region camps. Now, if you watch my films and read the documents we put out, that's exactly what we said the camps are and how they operate because we reverse engineered all this. The camps are already built. It's when they want to openly announce they're doing it that they then pass a law. And they say, oh, all these shut down military bases that they've been keeping refurbished and putting barbed wire facing in and putting in showers and uh, bunks. And, and we knew that those were to be the FEMA camps because in the FEMA documents and the congressional leaks and, and from people that worked at the camps, we knew and we would list the camps. Then we noticed when it was declassified in 97 that the very camps that had been, quote, decommissioned under the base closure, because they'd said back in the 80s under Rex 84 they were going to use the camps in Congress. So we said, you want to know where the camps are? They're old military bases, and they're old POW camps from Italians, Germans, and Japanese. Guess what's in here? Guess what's in the bill? They've reintroduced the National Compulsory Service under, under H.R. 1444. Uh, it says for mandatory national service. Uh, Defense Department announces civilian expeditionary workforce uh, in Pentagon Directive 1404.10. It says management retains the authority to direct and assign in civilian employees either voluntarily or involuntarily or on an unexpected basis to accomplish DOD mission. So, see, they're saying they're going to create a 7 million man. That was in the New York Times. The Congress said, I kept saying a million because Obama said as big as our army, as, as big as the military. That'd be a million people. They say 7 million now and that they're going to draft you into this and they'll decide no more draft boards if you stay here or if you go overseas. But this just broke. I just showed you the earlier terror training manual saying those that talk about the Constitution are terrorists and are a danger to police, those that are in Second Amendment groups. Here is the MIAC strategic report, and uh, this is 22009, the modern militia movement. And they mix in here people that believe there's nine FEMA regions, people that believe there's a NAPTA superhighway, and they show the official NAPTA superhighway map the government put out. Doesn't exist. Uh, those that don't want RFID chips being planted with them, and they mix it in then with white supremacists and others, and, and, and they say, we want you to understand the terrorist uh, symbols. It's don't tread on me flag of the, of the founding fathers, you know, the, the flag of the founding fathers, all of it. We're going to go over this. This is amazing. They say in there that there is you know, no such thing as a New World Order banking takeover, as hundreds of newspapers a day say there will be a new bank of the world that you pay carbon taxes to. It just doesn't exist. You're insane terrorist if you believe it. You know, I remember my grandfather's, and it, it was normal just when you were at the dinner table or, or even my dad to, to explain how governments work and how history worked, and they taught the military. You don't have the military on the streets, and, and we're here to defend the Constitution Bill of Rights, not what the president says if it violates that. And we've gone from that now to a strategic report, 22009, the modern militia movement, and then they mix gun owner groups, pro-gun groups, in with white supremacists. They say those that believe in a new world order, uh, these theories vary, but most always involve a globalist dictatorship. They show, and I'm putting on screen right now, official North American Union SPP maps that have been on CNN of how they're going to have every major highway be an international toll road from Mexico up into the deep north of Canada. And they just say it doesn't exist. These people are insane. I mean, this is a high level of psyop, isn't it, Gerald Salente? Well, you know, that's the way they always do things. You know, they, they lump them all together, and it's one size fits all. I have a question. Do you believe that the military will fire on its people? They're going to stage riots, and then it's going to look like, oh, they stopped the riots. It's reasonable to set the precedent. Like, oh, we do have FEMA camps for medical care and where you can stay. You know, the troops are here to help at car wrecks. That's how they're rolling it out. And uh, I believe that uh, I think the way they're going to manipulate the military, I think a lot of them are going to fire on U.S. citizens. Because that's a question we're going to pose in the Trends Journal in the next edition. And I, I happen to agree with you. 
they'll they'll stage riots. We always see these people that they call anarchists that always have black, you know, always have dressed in black and have masks on. They've been caught being police in... in, in they, sorry, go ahead. No, no, exactly. No, I'm, I agree with you. And I think that they are going to fire on the people, unfortunately. No, don't shoot me, please! Don't shoot me! I haven't done anything! In, in in this training manual that's going out to police everywhere in the country, it has a uh, you know don't tread on me flag. Uh, it shows America, freedom to fascism, and the film Zeitgeist in it. We just showed that, and shows it next to the Turner Diaries, which was a white supremacist thing about killing police. So see how they do guilt by association. I mean this is just off the charts, and, and this was sent to me. Uh, by the Missouri Information Analyst Center, police officers sent it to me. That's where they got it from. And I've seen these in Texas versions and others. It's, it's the same thing, but they're updating it. I mean, how do they say none of this exists and then mix in mainstream things that are happening with white supremacists and tell police that people are dangerous if they're into this? You're watching Police State 4, The Rise of FEMA. I wanted to take a little break out to explain the history of the police state documentary films. In 1999, in 2000, and 2001, I made the seminal police state films that were a viral success on the web and on VHS and DVD. Fast forward eight years later, it's all come true. Not because I have a crystal ball, but because I'm looking at government documents, I'm looking at the facts, I'm looking at their own white papers. If we can expose the FEMA camps, and the executive orders and the shadow government, their system will fail. I've made the film, Police State 4. It's now up to you to get it out to everyone you know. And yes, we need your support. We offer and promote the fact that they're free on YouTube, Google, and thousands of other video sites. We put them out for free. But we do ask you to give us the seed money, the support to run our websites, to do the syndicated radio show, and to make future films. So if you want this documentary in the best quality available and to have the expanded extras, please visit InfoWars.com and purchase Police State for the Rise of FEMA. You can call toll-free, 888-253-3139. You can visit InfoWars.com or PrisonPlanet.com. If it hasn't been blocked in your country yet, many have. You can also write to us at InfoWars, P.O. Box 19549. Austin, Texas, 78760. PrisonPlanet.tv is a better tool than ever in the info war. Over six years of my radio and TV shows, all my films in super high quality, my book, Paul Watson's book, all there, 15 cents a day. Your support of PrisonPlanet.tv empowers the resistance to unlock minds worldwide. The destiny of Police State 4, The Rise of FEMA is in your hands. I'm asking all of you to have public viewings, to make copies and to give to everyone you know. The power of humanity and the human spirit is unstoppable if you'll simply unleash it, if you'll simply take action and turn it loose. I salute you all. Good evening, my fellow Americans. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportion. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizen can compare the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense the prospect of domination of the nation's profits by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. 
We cannot mortgage the material assets of our grandchildren without risking the loss also of their political and spiritual heritage. Well, I think terrorism is being practiced on the residents of the city of Oakland because many of the uh, retired, in fact, retired teachers, retired military people have uh, informed me that uh, they, they understand what's going on and it's not anything that relates to humanitarian training whatsoever. This is a psychological, as we in the research community say, this is a psyops. They're preparing people for what is coming, not what is being presented today. So you're saying they're preparing people to accept it with incrementalism? That is correct, like the old frog example. You know, you put the frog in the water and you just gradually continue to raise the heat on the water until the frog is cooked. And that's the way it works. The problem is that the local people, people in general, just will not take their heads out of the sand. I'm going to tell everyone I can, listen, we have a serious problem. And it's called a police state. It's called a police state. Let's go ahead and get to this. I mean, you want to see you know, what, what goes with, with, with FEMA camps like a horse and carriage. Troops, militarized police, training with the Army to take over your cities and towns. Let's go ahead and play this YouTube clip, Martial Law is Coming, from News 7 at 11. The scenario was a fake, but the pepper spray and billy clubs used to break up this riot were definitely real. Good evening, I'm Miranda Stevens. Whether it's terrorism, riots, or any major disaster, local agencies will be the first to respond. That's why Roanoke City wants its disaster training to be as real as possible. Jeremy Butterfield has more. It's supposed to look like a riot, and the scene at William Fleming High School had all the elements. Well, I'm one of the rioters that the guard and the police force had to take down and arrest and did very successfully. <laughs> In this scenario, everyone has a role to play. The rioters were ready to fight back as Roanoke Police, Roanoke Fire, local National Guard troops, and members of the Virginia Defense Force secured perimeters and moved in to make the arrest. Prior to 9-11, these organizations couldn't communicate and did not work together. They worked to support each other, but not together. And with the recent events of the last three to five years, we've become very good at working together, which is very important. Of course, these weren't real rioters. The rebels in t-shirts were all members of one of the participating agencies, but you couldn't tell that during the exercise. If you weren't protected by an orange vest signifying you as an observer, you were in danger of being hit by eggs, bottles, billy clubs, or even the occasional well-placed round from a sniper. We try to make this very real, uh, give a real feel to it. We had some, the fire department provided some, uh, some live burning out here, so we had smoke, flames, objects being thrown, a lot of chaos. There's going to be a lot of chaos in a, in a civil disturbance situation, and, and that's what we want to try to incorporate as much as possible. Teamwork plays a major role. Mountain police had to coordinate with the fire department, while National Guard troops marched in formation toward the rioters. Without cooperation throughout all the agencies, the riders would have quickly taken control. I think everybody learned a little bit. Uh, mistakes are made, but we'd rather make those mistakes here than in a real situation. This was the fourth year the agencies have participated in this drill, and organizers say the old adage, practice makes perfect, certainly holds true in the face of disaster. And then, see, you talk about this, and mainstream writes articles about me like I'm crazy, making up troops and troop deployments when it's the Army Times, the Army War College, hundreds of newspapers have announced it, and then I say, hey, that's tyranny, and they go, shut up, Jones doesn't exist. Infowars story on illegal Tennessee checkpoint prompts action by governor. Friday, listeners pointed out local news saying the Army was going to be out, regular Army running checkpoints, searching citizens with police. The governor got called, our listeners called, the Wifa Police Department had plans to conduct a seatbelt checkpoint on Saturday, April 4th at Highway 64 within the city limits of Whiteville. The checkpoint was planned to be in conjunction with Homeland Security 
and the 251st Military Police in Bolivar. After learning about this, I contacted Representative Johnny Shaw, who represents that area, ask you about this. Uh, Representative Shaw, you, you looked into this, and can you tell me what you've learned and, and where this stands now? I, I can. Uh, actually, this has been canceled. Some calls were made to the governor's office about this on uh, earlier today, this Friday. And, of course, the governor just simply said, I don't need another headache. <laughs> It was a bad idea in the first place. I mean, during this climate and this day and time which we live, can you imagine the Army stopping you for a seatbelt check, you know? We'll follow up with you on that, sir, and find out what steps are taken to protect, uh, to see that something like this uh, is, uh, the, the public is notified in the future. Definitely we will, because the public should have been notified if it was going to happen. And I'm going to make sure that I call all of the local authorities and ask them not to do this in the mall, but if they should even attempt to, to make sure that they contact people like myself and make sure that people are notified as to what is going to happen. Uh, Representative uh, John Shaw just joins us for a few minutes. Representative from Tennessee, District 80. Sir, thank you for coming on with us. Sure, you're welcome. Thank you for having me, Alex. You bet. Now, we played the clip earlier of you on a local news station talking about Army checkpoints. Uh, mm -hmm. The governor found out, thanks to you and others, and canceled it. Can you just, in a nutshell, tell us exactly, uh, uh, specifically, what was going on? Uh, yes, I can. First of all, I, you know, I have got a check. Now, I don't have concrete facts, but I don't think the military has, first of all, any jurisdiction to be checking seatbelts. Uh, when you look at the fact of a military unit being out, uh, your, your daughter, my wife, or someone driving through a roadblock with all of these local officials, the Army and everybody out there, I think it's just going to scare people to death. I think our local and state officials have the staff when needed to check seat belts, uh, to do a seat belt check without the Army getting involved. And uh, I just don't think it's a good idea. Well, obviously, sir, uh, I don't know if you've heard, but yes, it still violates posse comitatus. They haven't completely removed that 1878 <clears throat> law. We know in Mexico and communist China, they have troops on the streets. This is a sign of a banana republic of a third world uh, police state. So that we don't want that. Uh, but the larger issue here is that they've announced Homeland Security wants to put 20,000 regular army troops to, to patrol America, the Naval War College, the Army War College has said their new job will be engaging us, uh, combat with the American people to stop an insurrection against the banks. Uh, so, A, are you aware of that? B, can you tell us specifically what units, how we, uh, why the Army was going to be out running checkpoints? Well, I got this news late on Friday, and when I got the news, I immediately jumped on it to try to call some local authorities that I knew first to see what was going on. And when I made the call, I found out at that point in time that the governor had already made the decision to cancel this, and which I was very proud of that. But I am not aware of Homeland Security doing this. I, I did hear that they would be involved in this roadblock issue on last Friday, but I am not aware of the other part of, of the question that you ask. Okay, specifically, though, when you talk to the local authorities, wh whose idea, where did it come from that regular army is going to be out running checkpoints? I mean, a checkpoint is unconstitutional if you don't have warrants and it's random for the police to do. Now the army? I mean, again, sir, this is suddenly happening everywhere. This is part of a larger plan. So we as detectives are asking you, uh, speci you know, any other little tidbits you've got about who was behind this? Well, and, and, and I don't know, Alex. I can't answer that question other than the fact that it was going to take place in a little area of my district uh, in a town called Whiteville, Tennessee, which would lead me to believe or to assume that the chief of police there was the one who uh, orchestrated this idea. Was the state involved? Uh, not to my knowledge at all. Okay, so the governor had to say no. So this is what we always see. The Army then probably approached some locals as part of their covert acclamation program. And uh, State Representative uh, Johnny Shaw, we appreciate you uh, speaking out against this. We appreciate the governor saying no to this. Can you just in closing speak to why you were concerned about it and against it? Well, again, I was concerned because I think in this in this economic climate or in this climate that we are in, well, can you imagine your wife, your daughter, my wife or daughter, even son driving up to a checkpoint 
with Homeland Security, the military police, the state police, if they were involved, and then, of course, all of your local authorities, it's going to make someone think something bad has happened in the community. And I just don't think this is a good idea. I think it's a, it would have been a scare tactic. That would have been hard for some of our citizens to get over, or maybe some of our senior citizens. And I'm totally against this kind of a tactic, and I'm going to do my best as a state representative to see that this does not happen again in my district and hopefully nowhere in the state of Tennessee. This is being done to acclimate the public so they don't panic when troops take over the city hall, the county, the state. This is high treason. And Obama has taken all these new powers that Bush claimed and has expanded them day one. And suddenly the left that was against it isn't saying a thing. So that's part of the preparation. Guardsmen to conduct urban training at Arcadia in April. This is going on scaled back now. It says in this article, going door to door, asking if they can search homes looking for weapons. And they practice raiding the local gun shop. And this is for domestic operations. Lieutenant Colonel, I really appreciate you coming on on such short notice, sir. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. You bet. Uh, I saw this uh, article out of the Daily Times Herald in Carroll, Iowa. H have you seen that? I sure have. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's telling us about an urban warfare drill to be held in several towns. Can, can you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, it's actually a, a planned training event uh, to provide uh, our soldiers with greater proficiency at what we call cordon and search, uh, which is a mission that, um, um, just for a little background, we've deployed nearly 13,000 members of the Iowa National Guard in the global war on terror. And the vast majority of those have been in Iraq and Afghanistan. And one of the missions that they perform in Iraq and Afghanistan on multiple occasions is cordon and search, where basically you are trying to, to get to an area, uh, cordon it off to make sure everything's safe, and then actually search for caches of weapons or other kinds of contraband which could harm um, American forces and other Like Fallujah, forces. what we saw in Correct. Fallujah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Exactly. So because of where we're located in Iowa, there are no active duty bases in Iowa. So we kind of have to create our own urban training environments. Uh, so the, the plan on this particular training event was to actually use a small town of about 450 people. Uh, the, the town has actually kind of adopted uh, the, the unit, which is called Company A, 1st Battalion, 168th Infantry. And uh, they, were, they were more than willing to participate in the exercise. Going through this article, I mean, explaining exactly what they're going to do door to door with the houses, what the checkpoints are going to be simulating. Sure. Um, when you're talking about cordon and search operations, you've got several different rings of security that you've got to provide in a particular area. And then it's important that people are treated respectfully as you go house to house, um, as you're looking for certain items, particularly in our experience in Afghanistan and Iraq, looking for weapon caches, uh, whether those have AK 47s. Um, RPGs, rocket propelled grenades, that is, uh, any kind of ammunition or any kind of improvised explosive devices, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And our job uh, when we go on a cordon search is to locate those kinds of items. And then there might also be persons of interest that we're interested in that coalition forces want to talk to or apprehend. Well, let's just boil it down to this. I have video of Army and Marines with role players screaming, I'm an American, please don't put me in the camp, uh, and the military trying to confiscate their firearms. I mean, certainly you've heard the Army Times and the new director from Secretary of Defense, Robert Gage, that they will use the National Guard under federal control uh, for civil insurrection. Are you, are you saying you're not aware of that? No, I'm certainly aware of that, absolutely. But I think you have to look at the role of the National Guard historically is that historically um, we are used uh, in states uh, for disasters overwhelmingly and our job is to number one be ready for uh, our mission uh, federally which is to go to war and number two is to help our fellow citizens mm -hmm. here in the united states of america mm -hmm. Those but the, the army that we prepare for and train for the army war college three weeks ago issued a report saying they're shifting a lot of their focus to engaging the american people and directives on engagement with the American people under NORTHCOM. 
Well, you got to remember that the National Guard, 99% of the time, is, in, if you're talking about peacetime, belongs to the state in which they are located. Uh, only on occasion do they become federalized. One of those examples, of course, is being mobilized and deployed uh, to go to war or peacekeeping or other kinds of federalized missions. But other than that, the National Guard generally in peacetime belongs to the governor of that state. Well, you're pretty informed on all these issues. Obviously, you're out in the middle of it. Have you, did you hear about the mainstream news articles about Marines in California and other places helping at DWI checkpoints with citizens? Would that uh, violate posse comitatus? I'm, I'm not aware of that. Um, with respect to active duty military, uh, that's called Title 10 when you're on active duty, and uh, they're not allowed to participate in uh, certain kinds of operations under the Posse Comitatus Act. Does that sound like freedom to you all over the country to have the National Guard at uh, big events like at the Kentucky Derby and the Super Bowl searching bags? Well, I think if you're talking about keeping Americans safe, um, it's our job to, to do whatever we can to, to help them with that. And um, if, if our job happens to be to detect weapons of mass destruction or other kinds of things that could harm a great deal of people, um, that's what we do. Now, here's your Pentagon Channel report. The Kentucky National Guard was part of the massive security force required for this weekend's Kentucky Derby. Officials say that 360 Guard members were on hand at Churchill Downs to help support law enforcement efforts for the first leg of horse racing's Triple Crown. Now, the troops took care of crowd and traffic control and provided three choppers and crews for aviation support. Officials at the track said that more than 150,000 fans turned out for the race. Police only had to make 44 arrests. International media, government staffers, and protesters. Thousands of them, all waiting for the G20 summit to begin. World leaders arriving in Pittsburgh for the G20 summit are finding a city on lockdown and already hit by violence. By order of the city of Pittsburgh chief police, I hereby declare this to be an unlawful assembly. I order all those assembled to immediately disperse. The G20 uh, basically represent the largest nations which participate in the Western banking cartel, which I feel is behind a lot of the pain, anguish, and misery that exists in our world today. They would like to come up with one central bank for the world to replace the dollar standard and uh, also have international regulation, you know, a massive expansion of the WTO regulations into the financial markets. You must leave the immediate vicinity. If you remain in this immediate vicinity, you will be in violation of the Pennsylvania Crimes Code, no matter what your purpose is. It's hard that it's setting up as like an us versus them when we're all in the same class. We're in it together, and they're protecting the interests of the world's billionaires. Anytime I've been on a march or anytime I've been arrested, it has been peaceful on our side. It's the state are the ones that cause the violence. You must leave. If you do not disperse, you may be arrested and or subject to other police action. Other police action may include actual physical removal, the use of riot control agents and or less lethal munitions. Ladies and gentlemen, this is breaking news. Do you know why my crew is not live with us right now while they're out of contact? They are under sustained LRAD sound cannon attack. You know, they rolled these out at tea parties in California and other places. First time I saw them was 2004 in New York. They have the National Guard engaging American citizens right now with deadly acoustic weapons that damage the middle ear. Uh, this is happening right now in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, while the G20 and mainstream news is getting rid of the dollar, bringing in world government against everybody right now. L listen, this is such a police state there that they tried to talk to the military and talk to a spokesman last night. Defense Link put a press release out, and they said, and they said no, we're not going to talk to you. Get out of here. Then, the, then they got their license number, had the police pose as Alamo rental car people from the county there, Allegheny County in Pennsylvania. They called them and said, oh, we, your, your car's got no brakes. Bring it in. And they said, well, we're in the cordon at G20. We're news reporters. We can't get out till tomorrow. And they said, well, that's fine, because I'm a police officer with the Army and FBI, and you've all been put on terror list, and your life's over, boy, and we know you're a terrorist, and you were sneaking around the military base and ran. All lies. Thank you very much. Okay, so I just went over. They're going to have a guy come out and talk to us, or they said they'll get us a number to contact. Uh, he said the PAO. This is probably him right here.
every 30 seconds, you know, saying disperse, disperse. We've got them. Let's go to live now. Here they are from Pittsburgh. G20 under attack. Yeah, we're, we're on uh, 33rd and Liberty, and uh, we just passed a, uh, they had a block, the tree blocked off, and they were using the sonic weapon on us. They uh, were using it to broadcast, and then they would ramp up the signal for a brief second to let them know that they could, you know, blow some eardrums out. It got pretty loud. I hereby declare this to be an unlawful assembly. I order all other police actual physical of everybody dispersed, though, and that started happening. The one group, the largest group, went through an alleyway. They're driving right past me right now. Get them on tape. With, with the uh, gun. They had two of them. They were using them to broadcast messages in Spanish and English. That's their that engine right now. You can hear it passing me. And there's a guy sitting on top. The police I'm seeing now are in full rag here. Are they the police, though, wearing the National Guard bottoms? Um, it looks like Border Patrol. I've seen Border Patrol here, too. They have the dark green uh, Border Patrol uniform. So federal police in the middle of, a, of Pennsylvania. I find it very ironic that it's happening on Liberty Avenue. Very ironic. Burmas, I want to be clear about this. They, they were shooting you guys with this. Douglas was saying it was hurting. What was this like? The decibel level was very, very high. One moment I was covering the front of the protest. The next moment my eardrums were blasting. And as that happened, I basically turned around, saw about 40 riot police assisted by military, and I ran up and I got all the footage I could. Every once in a while, I'd have to take There you go, assisted back. by military. So this is the military attacking the American people. Because in every, every news article I see, they're together. So that's key for the article Watson's doing. The military was with them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they were in military fatigue. Uh, SWAT is also here. Uh, I got a good shot of one of the military personnel who went on top of the uh, Pittsburgh paddy wagon. Basically, most of the Humvees in the military were cordoning off at checkpoints on Main Street in the main city of Pittsburgh. They were in full military fatigues. I mean, these weren't just the uh, the pants. They were they were the tops. Um, it, it, there's no doubt that there's military here, Alex. I approached them. I asked them what their mission was. What's the mission? You can't say. Sir, what would you have to say to, to critics that say this is a violation of posse comitatus? I'd say that you need to talk to my PAO. You know what posse comitatus is? No. Okay, no? So Separation no. of uh, military and police? Be the first military guy to tell me what it is. I've asked about a dozen today. No, but nothing, right? And uh, it was the standard boilerplate answer of you know, we're just following orders. We're just here to support law enforcement. That's all we know. We're here to protect, we're here to protect United States citizens' rights to a peaceful protest. Unbelievable. <laughs> Global leaders meeting openly in mainstream news to get rid of the dollar and bring in, quote, global governance. This is the end of our country, and the police and the military are acting like people that don't like it are pure scum and terrorists because the DHS has trained them to do that. Uh, here, come the, here come the anarchist staging. Here they come right now. They're, 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 they just grabbed the dumpster. They're flipping it over. Video it. I got it. I got it on tape right now. Uh, I don't want to put you in danger, Jason, but if you follow that stinking fed, is it a big guy? All right, it was three people, and of course they had masks on, Alex. Briefly, tell folks about last night. You guys pull up to the gate. You asked to talk to the public information officer. They called the police and lied and said that you were sneaking around. Yes, sir. How's it going? Um, we were responding to a news story that the National Guard was going to be masked um, to go into Pittsburgh. And can we get a comment on that? Sorry, we can't make any comments, sir. Do you have a press guy we can talk to? Yeah, yeah. We then pulled off to the side of the road where they instructed us to. We waited around 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, a representative came back. Immediately, he was hostile towards us. He did not like our credentials. Hey, guys. Hey, good evening, sir. What's up? Look how you're How you doing? Uh, my name's Rob. Okay. Uh, we're out of uh, Austin, Texas, Channel 10. Hey, can I see your credentials? Um, we tried to get as much information as we could. He refused to answer our questions. So then uh, Rob asked him for his information and where we could contact him. Uh, tomorrow, if we could get a word with him, he then gave it, and we left. Speech, freelance reporter? Yes, sir. Okay, so what are you looking for? Well, we, we're following up on a report that we got, and it's, um, that we read, it said there's 2,500 troops that are going to be deployed into Pittsburgh for the G20 for security. Once again, do you have, uh, I'd like to talk to your editor. I'm more than welcome to, I'm more mm -hmm. than willing to do this. So you got somebody back at the station I can talk to? you guys have credentials for the G20? I can't, 
in the middle of the night, you come here tomorrow, we'll see what we can, we can accommodate you. We're not going to... I mean, we only got a few questions, man. Yeah, we just have, like, four questions. The answer is no. I'm not going to comment. No, I'm not. That's okay. We're going to provide the interview. If you, if you get some credentials, you get some that I can work with, I'll do the interview. Uh, we didn't run away from anything. By the time that we had left, turned around, and exited the main military facility, there was another car uh, parked on the other side of the road, waited for us to pass, followed us for uh, an exit, then uh, got off, and then we were shot when uh, Douglas got a call trying to entrap him and have us go return our rental car for quote unquote two more free days. Uh, when we didn't fall for that, he then came clean and said he was actually military personnel and he wanted to know whether or not we were terrorists, Alan. And then he told Douglas, you're on a list now, pal, for the rest of your life. Yeah, he did. With pleasure. You ran from them, is that true? Absolutely not. Can I have your name and number so we can call you tomorrow? Sure. Okay. One seven eight two one. Mm hmm Chris Cleaver. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. I need all info warriors, anyone in the Northeast, anybody in the Midwest to go to Pittsburgh now with video cameras. The the troops are bought and paid for by offshore banks. The Republic is falling right now. They are openly destroying our precious republic. Right now, they are openly bringing in martial law. They have troops deploying in every major city. This is just another beta test. We need everybody to go to Pittsburgh who loves this country. Come with cameras, uh, radio host. Everybody needs to get there and needs to expose these people. And, sh and we need people to follow the anarchists. They're going to go back to military installations. It's happened in every case. We proved it in Denver. We proved it in Ottawa. We proved it in Seattle. We proved it in London. We proved it in Genoa. We prove it every time. You've now been hit by the army and police. This is like, this is like Kent State with sound weapons. This is huge news, and it's nowhere right. on TV. Cindy, tell us what happened. We're trying, just trying to get to downtown so we can exercise our freedom of speech, Alex. And you know they're blo they're blocking peaceful peaceful protesters. We don't have any weapons. They're blocking us with the most um, disastrous, horrible weapons that they can think of. And so, yeah, it's just, it's just really um, awful down here. They have your Alawad. The Alawad was used in Iraq and Afghanistan against Turkey. You're now using these weapons against the American people. How do you feel about that? This is all about training you that you're not supposed to protest and demonstrate. That's why the police pose as anarchists in every case. They've been caught over and over again. This is how the Republic falls, with the stormtroopers in the streets and the world leaders coming to our country to sell it out and the mainstream news reporting it. You guys are hurting your own people. Here. Cindy, did you know they're openly announcing the formation of a world government at this meeting? Yes, I and know the, they are. The head of the EU e even spoke out against it, Klaus, at the uh -huh. UN yesterday, and they're openly announcing the end of the dollar. Those troops don't know that their whole savings and their whole family future is gone, and there they are with pleasure, guarding right. the very government that is illegitimate and criminal. The troops are out here. There are our brothers and sisters. There are sons and daughters, and there are mothers and fathers. And they're turning their guns on us. They're turning their weapons on us, where we really should be marching to the G20 and arresting those guys. Here they come again with their LRAD, Alex. They're, com they're coming with it. They have us blocked in. There's nowhere okay. for us to go. This is what police looks like. By order of the city of Pittsburgh, I hereby declare this to be an unlawful assembly. I order all those assembled to immediately disperse. You must leave the immediate vicinity. Uh, if you remain in this immediate vicinity, you will be in violation. And so 
Marmus. Yes, sir. Did you say that the protesters are turned around because they're blocked in? Yes, they are blocked in. Run! Get out! I told you! Go down the side street, get the hell out of there, they're going to get you. Get out of there right now. My Jason, are you there? Amazing to have Burmas and Cindy Sheehan and all these people together. They're standing as Tierney. She lost her son. And the military will follow orders, and that's all this is. And there are the bankers openly setting up world government, bankrupting us by design. It's really happening. Well, here's the Examiner newspaper reporting on these at, these sound weapons at, at uh, the tea parties. It says uh, both town halls took place with, without incident. However, the use of military device concerned San Diegans. The LRAD crowd control is primarily used in Iraq to control insurgents and can cause serious and lasting harm to humans. And they admit this. I mean, this is just outrageous. Other police action may include actual physical removal, the use of riot control agents and or less lethal munitions, which could cause risk of injury to those who remain. You must leave. Now, let's go ahead and go over these articles. Brigade Homeland Tour starts October 1st. 3rd Infantry's 1st BCT trains for new dwell time mission. Helping people at home may become a permanent part of active army. And then you read this. The Washington Post reported it. Everybody else did. It says, for riot control and civil unrest during a collapse of society. Then the Army War College came out a month later and said, yes, we're preparing to engage the American people. So there's that going on. So they have to have troops to take you to the FEMA camps. Washington Post, 20,000 more U.S. troops to be deployed for domestic security. They then expanded and said it won't be 4,000 troops, it'll be 20,000. Now they're saying, oh, it'll be 40,000 regular Army troops. The, the very troops that were in Baghdad doing gun confiscation, the very best troops they've got. Well, here's another one. Marines admit security force to operate inside U.S. This directly from the Marine Corps' own website. And they did it with role players, uh, you know, practicing confiscating people's guns. Here's another one. Unit learned skills to fight different enemy. And uh, this is uh, out of the American Force Press Service. See, this is all part of acclamation. And then in a four-state area, 
in the Midwest a few months ago, there was a report about the army suddenly locking down parts of cities and doing, and then the disgraced Governor Blagojevich uh, announced about five months ago before he had that big scandal, and we played the newscast here where he said we're going to have the army go door to door confiscating guns in Illinois. And then we have the first time the army got called in New Orleans going to the high and dry areas with the police and FBI. All the weapons will be taken. No one will be allowed to be armed. And then putting people in handcuffs that had guns, taking their guns. Today in New Orleans, they got a lot tougher on the holdouts. Police department in your home! Not only the flooded areas, but New Orleans' driest and wealthiest neighborhoods, too. Police department! The police and National Guard going street by street, house to house. We need to make sure, too, that uh, whenever we knock on doors, people refuse to leave. We need to make note, call it in. They say there are no orders to use force, just strong persuasion. Sometimes entering open houses with guns drawn and instructions to disarm anyone inside. You say guns, guns will be taken. No one will be able to be armed. We yes, will sir. take all yes, weapons. Sir. That happened today in this wealthy neighborhood where homeowners had armed themselves to protect their mansions. <laughs> Residents were handcuffed on the ground. In the end, police took their weapons but let them stay in their homes. They were a little bit threatened because our weapons were bigger than their weapons. For many of the police and guard troops, it is an uncomfortable job to do this in an American city. This guard unit occupied a church, using it as a base camp. They had to leave a note because they could not get hold of the pastor to get permission. It is, it is surreal. Yeah, you just never, you never expect to do this in your own country. Chris Montgomery says he'd rather be in Iraq than patrolling American neighborhoods. Walking up and down these streets, you don't, you don't want to think about the stuff that you're going to have to do. Somebody pops around the corner. Let me shoot an American. Yeah. I mean, that's on record. That happened. This is what they're training for. This is what they do the first chance they get. Stop living in denial. Attention, attention, attention. American forces are here to help. Remain calm. We will not tolerate civil disobedience. Throw the gun away, Mr. Randall. Go on, throw it. Don't fix, mister. This is the poorest county in Montana, and the $27 million prison has turned into a white elephant. Because there are no prisoners, Glenn and Ray Perkins got laid off after moving to Hardin to take guard jobs. When I went to the door, there were two cops standing with their hands on their guns. I've lived in the same town for 26 years. We got 90 and 94 sitting right over here where they intersect, which is a perfect place for a checkpoint. I noticed that they got these mobile checkpoint stations. There's a lot of secrecy going on. I'm concerned about the legitimacy of who they are. Nothing is square in this whole thing. I cannot let my grandchild grow up in this kind of thing. And its main focus is to bring prisoners and jobs to Harden. We've got a beautiful, beautiful facility here. Becky, it's, it's, I mean, it's time to get straight with us now. We, we need to know these things. I think the people of Harden need to know this.
Becky, Becky shared for her pay package. I don't know what she made as a reporter for the Gazette, but I know it wasn't much. But here, she's getting paid $60,000 a year, plus a house, plus a Mercedes. Vehicle. I don't understand who this company is and why they... Follow the money. Where were they two years ago? Follow the money. That's all I have to say. Where were they before the ground broke? Follow the money. And its main focus is to bring prisoners and jobs to harm. Think it's serious at all? Um, it probably is to those that don't know what's going on. Carrie Smith is the wife of Two Rivers Authority Executive Director Greg Smith, who was recently placed on administrative leave. Well, members of uh, the American Police Force showed up in Hardin yesterday driving vehicles with Hardin Police written on them. As Color 8's Nick Law reports, it created quite a stir, especially because Hardin doesn't have a city police department. This was the talk of the town in Hardin on Thursday. Mercedes decked down in the city of Hardin Police Department decals and driven by American Police Force members. Two Rivers Authority officials say having APF patrol the streets was never part of their agenda. Tell people what's really happening here. Well, first of all, Alex, around the country, it's not just in Montana, but specific areas are being uh, identified as staging grounds. And just recently, we had 12 uh, Tajikistan troops, some um, BMWs. These are the same BMWs that you and I talked about uh, meeting. And by the way, the UN admits their main force is Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. Uh, and uh, Egyptian and Pakistani. That's their main UN force. Well, well, Steve, we know in Serbia they've had black sites, the secret ghost sites with the kidnap, snatch and grab people. Absolutely. We, we know we know that they're in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Pakistan. We know they're in Egypt. We know they're in Germany. We know they're in Poland. We know they're in the Czech Republic. Uh, we also know that they are in other areas. And so this fits the classic M.O. where they use these private ghost contractors to run this. Oh, I'm having trouble right now even dealing with this and processing it. Oh. Man, talk about Spookville, CIAville, black sedans running like roaches. When you flip the light on at 3 a.m. in your apartment, there's like big fat roaches going. And they're like, ah! Now the locals are getting upset by these black Mercedes SUVs that have Hardin, Montana on them, and then the double eagle crest, just announcing, we are your police. This is insane. Men with foreign accents stomping around. I mean, this is Red Dawn happening. And the local officials are going, yeah, we've been told they run the camp and that they run the, the town now. I mean, this is Twilight Zone. We're going to go to phone calls here in just a moment. Let's talk to Diane in Montana. Diane in Montana, where this is going on. But as Steve said, it's happening everywhere. Uh, Diane, what's your info? Okay, September 9th, we had a small incident where there was a bunch of SUVs, black Hummers, you name it. It was all there. They even brought a helicopter in. It was four miles from my home. So when we went to check it out, they were all over climbing the mountains in camo, dressed up. Had, they were armed, and they said they were just doing a training exercise. Called the sheriff's office, and we got the same story. It's just FBI training, but it was FEMA, right in Superior. And we're probably about maybe 4,000 population. What did the locals think? And how many FBI FEMA troops were there? Okay, there were six vehicles when my husband went right by them. He called back and said, lock down. I don't know what's going on, if there's escape prisoners or what. Same time, helicopter came through, right overhead. Called his secretary, who was coming in on I-90, told her to check that area out and look at it. And that's when she saw all the camo guys all over the mountainside just crawling up. Asked around town, people didn't think anything about it. We now go live to Alex Jones on the ground in Hardin, Montana. Alex? Okay, we just got a tour. 
from Becky Shea, the former Billings Gazette reporter that's now the PR spokesperson for this facility for American Police Force. She admitted that it'll be a foreign uh, paramilitary mercenary training facility. She admitted that it's going to be a detention facility. Uh, the point is, is this is just off the charts. Uh, they're now doing massive damage control. They're about to give us a tour of the outside of the facility. I just got a tour of only one wing of this gigantic $27 million facility. They would not let us into most of the areas. Just while I was in some of the offices, I saw blueprints, I saw documents. I'm just going to leave it at that. But this story is definitely the mother load. This is definitely a black site slash ghost site in the United States. They plan to have this be a ghost site, but locals blew the whistle. They were definitely going to try to become the police through the Two Rivers Authority, basically taking over the town of Harden. Uh, this individual is tied in with high-powered uh, Serb operatives. His dad is some type of... Uh, high-ranking uh, uh, Serb, uh, Chatar, but he won't give anybody else his name. Then you have this Hilton character. Again, that's a fake name. He's Serbian. Uh, there are German troops here, German paramilitaries, British paramilitaries, uh, but they're keeping uh, back from us deeper in the facility. Yes, yes I am in one of the black uh, Mercedes-Benz SUVs inside the, the detention center. Becky is going to be, I'm going to be using the, the phone as a microphone. Uh, so she can give us a live report. Becky, uh, what about Blackwater connections? We've been hearing a lot about that in the company and in several places as brag if they have Blackwater connections. I've heard so many names that it's just absolutely phenomenal to me. We're not disclosing the name of our parent company. Um, and, and that's just, that's it. We're not disclosing the name of our parent company. We stand alone. Oh, there's a parent company. Well, there is a parent course. company of American Police Force. There is an umbrella company. American Police Force stands alone as a corporation, um, and and we are American Police Force. We are who we are. But if it's a secretive group owned by a secret group and, the, and it's headed by a 14-time felon, and then they were putting police decals on their vehicles the first few days, I mean, don't people have a right to be a little bit concerned about this, Becky? There are newscasts for saying they wanted this be Guantanamo Bay West. That was on CNN. That was not American Police Force, and I'd ask you to go back and recheck your sources. That was too... So ridiculous. they've not been requesting to have this as a facility to hold detainees? No, sir, and, and please, everyone listen carefully. Two Rivers Detention Facility will not hold Guantanamo Bay nor other multinational offenders for a minimum and maybe... Why did I see Why did I see documents on the wall, blueprints, saying foreign alien detention facility? This is real. This is a ghost site slash black site that we have on. This is this is a FEMA center they want to hold. She was telling me I saw blueprints all over the place, scanning them quickly. And I was walking through the facility, and she'd say, "Oh, don't take that, or don't you know, don't show that." Where it was saying alien detention, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, troop barracks, processing facility. And she admitted they're going to do training to process people and to go out and set up checkpoints with with cat scan scanners is the way she called them, scan people's goods. So this is a huge problem. Processing center. I don't think she even knows everything. She seems pretty freaked out. She gets hired and finds out all this. And we went and interviewed bed and breakfasts because there's hardly any hotels here. Uh, at two of the places, they said, oh, absolutely. Germans, uh, Czechs, uh, Brits, uh, a lot of Serbs, uh, really hardcore looking people. Won't pay in cash, act really suspicious. They've been here for a year. I mean, this is insane what we're dealing with up here. And they're just trying to act like it's all fine. We're not going to tell you our parent company. Everything's fine. Everything's wonderful. I mean, this is bizarro land. Well, court uh, records from Orange County, California indicate Michael Hilton has a lengthy criminal past, including a six year prison sentence for a dozen counts of grand theft and other charges. And we learned just yesterday there's a warrant out for Hilton's arrest in Wyoming. American Police Force pulls out of contract negotiations with Two Rivers Authority. All right, Sarah Gravely joins us now live from the newsroom to tell us more about the latest development in this story. Sarah? Hey, Greg, Kathy. APF spokeswoman Becky Shea says it was a company decision to pull out. She says they learned things about the facility that made them lose interest in the deal. Schedule for a special report. Uh, here is uh, Wall Street Journal. KBR awarded Homeland Security contract worth up to $385 million to build 
three one million person FEMA camps in the United States. It says the ICE detention and removal operations program can be used for illegal aliens and for U.S. citizens and for other emergencies. Here's the New York Times. Halliburton subsidiary gets contract to add temporary immigration detention centers. Just like under Rex 84, the documents came out in the 80s. They said the cover would be for illegal aliens, but it would be a really a martial law takeover plan and to t suspend the Constitution and take over the media. So there's the New York Times we have saved up on PrisonPlanet.com. Also, uh, George Bush reopened all the Japanese and, and German uh, prisoner of war camps in the U.S. and put water in, light in, and then just have them set up and ready. That was in uh, the CBS News, Bush to preserve World War II internment camps. So there's uh, that article. Pentagon paying for fake news in the U.S., White House paying for fake news in the U.S. It's now in the tens of billions every year. This is what's going on. The, the fake news reports they produced and put on radio and TV that were made by the government. I've had Congress people on talking about how it's illegal, the fake news. All of this is being done. Fake polls, everything. How are they preparing the public? When I saw this at the time, I saw Tommy Franks and Cigar Aficionado. I saw Tommy Franks on CNN, Fox, MSNBC go, gee, it's, I'm real sorry about this, but one more big terror attack, we're going to have a military form of government and martial law. I'm real sad about that, but that's what the American people are going to demand. That's the only thing that will keep them safe. Now, you don't expect him to come out and say, gee, we're going to have a military dictatorship. Militaries throughout history love taking over societies 99% of the time. And America's just been in the exception. Now, he's got to introduce it like, gee, shuck, I'm real upset, but it is the only thing that'll keep us safe. The Constitution won't survive a WMD attack. And I said at the time, I said, he is part of the Pentagon's billions in fake news. That's illegal. The General Accounting Office has already ruled that, that, that they're paying off reporters and people to go on TV. I said, I bet my bottom dollar, Franks is being paid off. Now they're rolling them out in the news. The camps will be for you when you're starving during the collapse of society, which is what the IMF and World Bank have done to countless third world countries and their own documents say they want to do it here. They have to fully bankrupt you so they can consolidate everything with the tens of trillions of fiat currency they're holding and hoarding of taxpayer money. And then once the riots start, which they're trying to push, you know, they have Bazinga Brzezinski on MSNBC. We played that the other day saying, I'm really worried about these bankers. They're going to cause riots nationwide. Millions and millions of unemployed. People really facing dire straits. And we're going to be having that for some period of time before things hopefully improve. And at the same time, there is this public awareness of this extraordinary wealth that was transferred to a few individuals. And you sort of say to yourself, what's going to happen in this society when these people are without jobs, when their families hurt, when they lose their homes and so forth? As if he isn't one of the engineers of it. See, they know they've got revolution on their hands. They know that we did our job warning the people and exposing what was happening and, and, and putting all this information out, and people found out it was true. Here it is. This is from my film, The Road to Tyranny. I have 18 hours of this. I have them training all over the country. I have them teaching police to arrest anybody with a get us out of the U.N. sticker. This is what's been going on. Here it is. It damn hurts, because think about the Christians, okay? Do you accept Jesus Christ, your Lord, and say, you know, what did they do? They took your head off. They beheaded you if you didn't accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. See, this is reality. Yeah, they're terrorists, but the bottom line is for them, they are not. When people are passionate about what they believe in, they become a very difficult enemy to be. Who was the first terrorist organization in the United States? <clears throat> the who? Founding Fathers. Founding Fathers. You mean Thomas Jefferson? Look at this guy. You know, he's talking about the Founding Fathers. And, and, and people that are committed, he's talking about constitutional terrorists before that, the cops are so conditioned, they say, who, you know, who are the terrorists? Who are the first terrorists? The Founding Fathers. They all know. They all say Founding Fathers. They've already been taught this many times. He says, that's a very difficult enemy to beat. No, you are the enemy when you become an enemy of the Bill of Rights and Constitution and let foreign bankers take us over. Play it again. The guys who we call our Founding Fathers, George Washington, Mr. Honest, who cut down a cherry tree and admitted it, is the same guy 
who signed death orders, if you will, on members of the British government, the British crown, who they wanted to eliminate because politically they had influence in certain pockets of the United States at that time, the 13 colonies, and they wanted to divide and conquer. They may get a whole lot of civilians, and hey, let's, I'm going to be honest with you, okay? If they kill 10,000 civilians tomorrow with a biological agent, that's too bad for them. You see, it was all about Bush was going to do this. No, Bush was a puppet. Just like Nixon and Carter and Reagan and Bush and Clinton and Bush and Obama, they're just puppets and we always obsess over them and the media acts like they're running something. It's the executive power held by the National Security Council. In fact, three weeks ago, they had an article about General James Jones and the National Security Council saying they've now taken over continuity of government, even from the executive and Homeland Security, and that this private group runs it all. And then General uh, Jones was in the CFR website saying, writing, I take all my orders from former national security heads, Henry Kissinger and the CFR. I mean, that's why in the last week there have been four mainstream news articles that we posted at Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.com with Bilderberg group members like Etienne Davignon, the chairman of Bilderberg, saying, we set up the European Union, we set up the G20, we've, we've set up the new world order banking system. I mean, now they're openly bragging it's world government and they run it. But it is the awareness itself that will drive the change. And one of the ways it will drive the change is through global governance and global agreements. But the many business leaders who have been present here uh, are among those taking leadership in other ways. Yet these problems can be overcome by a joint effort in our, and between our countries. 2009 is also the first year of global governance with the establishment of the G20 in the middle of the financial crisis. The climate conference in Copenhagen is another step towards the global management of our planet. This is collective action, people working together at their best. I think a new world order is emerging and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. And then if I dare talk about it, they go, oh, shut up, Jones. You crazy nut, none of that exists. And if you talk about it, you're going to cause violence. Just give in to the new world order, roll over to it, hand your guns in. Let's start with uh, the airport adventures, which they now admit are going nationwide with the Viper teams at bus stops, train stops, the streets, shopping malls, random vans, sending you through body scanners, biometrically scanning 360, your naked body. Now, I've seen more in-depth images by the actual companies where they can zoom in on pores. Okay, so they're showing you a low-res image, but totally naked. Your family, it's child porn. They don't care. Uh, now, if you take a picture of your two-year-old daughter in diapers, and this, this made ABC News and CNN, the children's bottoms weren't even seen, but because the children were had towels around them hugging. That was a three-year-old and two-year-old. They were arrested. Their children were taken. So that's uh, things that aren't bad are called bad. But then the government recording your naked wife, you, your children, and now they're going in at all major airports, 214, and their uh, people in Houston are being forced through them. But people are refusing and saying, no, you perverts, you're not going to do that. So Aaron Dykes and Rob Dew back from six days of adventure uh, with uh, the police state in Canada and the U.S. Uh, tell us what happened. Well, I got hit up first. This was in uh, D.C. flying to Detroit. You got long hair. You get That's pulled right. out every time. Some <laughs> kind of Al Qaeda. But uh, what I, Aaron was already through um, security, and I walked through, and they go, "Oh, sir, can you step in here?" And I said, uh, "So what's that?" And they said, "Oh, this is our RFID scanner." And I said, "No, I'm not going in there." And uh, what do you mean? And I said, "I'm not going in there." I don't. I said, "I don't agree with that." And they said, "Oh, well, it's voluntary." I said, "Well, good. I'm not doing it." Yeah, but so that's like SeaWorld made you thumbprint. Right. At first it was voluntary, now it's mandatory. It's like dog training. Passengers describe a terror attack and the arrest of a suspect who tried to blow up a plane as it landed at Metro Airport. We heard a loud pop, then a bit of a smoke. Sounded first like a balloon being popped. All of a sudden heard some screams and flight attendants ran up and down the the aisles and everything's crazy people are screaming there's fire on the plane so there's a lady shouting back and she was saying uh, 
things like, uh, what are you doing, what are you doing? Um, and uh, at that moment, I was sure I was going to die. And we're learning tonight more about the suspect. Let's get to Fox News' Andrea Isom. She begins our team coverage. She is live at Metropolitan Airport. Andrea? As the hours go on, you are right. We are learning more about the suspect, and quite frankly, the details are chilling. The man, the menace, 23-year-old Abdul Mudala of Nigeria. Mudala's despicable actions were all on al-Qaeda's behalf. Sources telling Fox News his instructions were to blow up the plane over U.S. soil. The intelligence community knew about Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib weeks ago and failed to spread word that would have put him on the no-fly list. The father of the suspect in the Christmas incident warned U.S. officials in Africa about his son's extremist views. That a report was prepared and it was sent on to the CIA in Langley, Virginia, CIA headquarters, but it was not disseminated to the wider intelligence community. Obviously, when you have a father coming in, and talking to the embassy about a son who's radicalized, gives the embassy the passport number. The first thing you would think is a, a very fast effort to see if the person's got a visa and suspend the visa. One of the things you don't know about is the number of people that we have turned away because their name has been on the watch list uh, or on the no-fly list. Only my mom could, but not me and my dad, because both me and my dad are, are on the watch list. Tough to believe, but eight years later, we are still talking about connecting the dots at a failure to communicate. Call for immediate reviews on how this guy got on the plane and how he was able to get some explosives off the plane. So we got a war off the plane. Uh, this is a, uh, a controlled patsy. Facts are facts. You can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. And we have this, uh, this same pattern that we've seen again and again. We have these individuals that have very limited mental equipment, but nevertheless, they're able to work miracles. In other words, they can do things that a normal person would never be able to do. You'd be arrested, you'd be questioned, you'd be searched, you'd be stopped in some way. He gets out of countries, he's disheveled, looks like he's drugged, <laughs> stumbling around. I mean, this is classic. He doesn't, he doesn't get on any serious... Uh, list of, uh, for scrutiny or, or special search. And then we have this famous story of the well-dressed Indian who accompanies him. I saw two men and they caught my eye because they seemed to be an odd pair. One was uh, what I would describe as a poor-looking black teenager around 16 or 17. And the other, the other man, a, a age 50-ish, uh, wealthy-looking Indian man. And I was just wondering why they were together. They're kind of strange. And I watched them approach what I would call the, the ticket agent, the final person that checks your boarding pass before you get on the plane. He gets from one plane to another thanks to this Patsy Minder, a Patsy chaperone or Patsy monitor. The only person that spoke was the Indian man. And what he said was, uh, this man needs to board the plane, but he doesn't have a passport. And the ticket agent responded, well, if he doesn't have a passport, he can't get on the plane. To which the Indian man responded back, uh, he's from Sudan. We do this all the time. And the ticket agent said, well, then you'll have to go and talk to my manager. And she directed that, them down a hallway. Uh, and, and that was the last time that I saw the Indian man mm -hmm. and the black man I didn't see again until he tried to blow up our plane. Then I'd be interested to see, is there a passport? Won't the FBI please show us a passport if there is one? They won't release the videos from Amsterdam. I mean, this is suspicious. Oh, yes. I think it's beyond suspicious. It's a clear case of a patsy. So he's a controlled asset. And, of course, it's not a matter of failure to connect the dots. We're hearing all about the unconnected dots. No, this is the desired outcome. Let me just point out a couple of other things here. Uh, we're told that uh, the, uh, the, this uh, alleged uh, bomber, right, the Nicker bomber, whatever they call him, uh, he was in contact with this character, Aulaki, in Yemen. And, of course, he, this Aulaki, I call him Aulaki the CIA lackey. Aulaki the lackey, and remember, he's a CIA lackey. He's a double agent, a triple agent, if you want. He is used uh, as a kind of beacon to recruit patsies across the world, and they can only sheep-dip somebody like Major Hassan if they want to say, 
your link to Al Qaeda, they just have you exchange a few emails with this Al Laki, and that's what he's good for, right? He goes back to 9/11 and Hani Hanjour. So this this guy is uh, he's he's a he's a U.S. agent under whatever layers of, of garb that he's got. The other thing is, how was this uh, young uh, Patsy uh, Omar Farouk Mutalab? How was he radicalized? And I think we're getting some pretty good indications that it's this Brixton Mosque, Finsbury Mosque access in London, the school for patsies, the, the British patsy Which, patsy. by the way, six months ago, I remember it, you predicted we'd see plane bombings out of that mosque. It, this is not so hard to do. Remember, Richard Reed, Richard Reed, mentally retarded vagrant who was sleeping on the floor of Brixton Mosque, I think, he was given the same PETN uh, explosive by somebody, so that's what this, this uh, Omar Farouk was given then, allegedly, once again, in in Yemen, so you can see it, it all it fits together, and it, it all comes from these same these same places. There are reports today that the Christmas Day body bomber met with an American-born radical cleric, Anwar Al-Awlaki. He's believed to be living in Yemen. Al-Awlaki is. He's not only been linked to Al Qaeda in the past, but he reportedly exchanged emails with the suspected Fort Hood shooter Nadal Hassan before that shooting massacre in Texas. I would also point out that the security company at Schiphol Airport is ICTS, which is a uh, Israeli-owned firm. They were the same firm that allowed Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, to board the flight, the American Airlines flight to Miami. Same, uh, uh, same uh, uh, explosive uh, material was found in his shoes as was found in Mr. Mutalib's underwear. They ignored the threats on purpose. Obviously, this, uh, you know, we had a lot of people sitting at home over the Christmas holidays. Families gathered around a television set. Uh, yeah, another terror attack. Huge problems for travel now. When we talk about screenings at the airport and, and other protective mechanisms along the way, what should we be doing that clearly we're not? And the scanning machines that we currently are beginning to deploy in the U.S. that would give us the ability to see what someone has concealed underneath their clothes. These body scanners are the key with like, uh, you know, these different psychological syndromes where people serve the abuser. Yeah, because uh, that's where you have to get in as to where this is going. It's not fun. It's degradation. It's the dehumanization of the individual. So really, what they're telling you is not only do you not own, own your body, you own nothing. You don't even own the patterns to your own genes. They're telling you you're a piece of property. What do they do when you first come into a prison? They strip you and do a medical exam to humiliate you. They hold you down in front of other prisoners and they laugh at you, make jokes about you. When Aaron went through, it was even worse because I was behind him. Yeah, I went through. He told me to go through the scanner and I said no. He said, why aren't you going to do it? I said, it violates my privacy. And, and this is what happened. This guy got scared. This guy was <gasps> bigger than me. He was athletic. Ooh. He started shaking when I said no. You think it doesn't matter to well, Because it's a delusional world. He thought he'd found a real terrorist. Yeah. He was shaking, visibly shaking, when I said no. And he tried to trick me to go through it again and told me they were going to body wand me, which they ended up doing. And then he tells me, oh, because I don't like it, because it violates my Fourth Amendment, I read too much. Oh, you're one of those who reads too much. And you said he put his hands on you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he grabbed When I said no, like he started shaking. He didn't know what to do. And then his first flinch reaction was to grab my arm and try to pull me through the scanner. It was absolutely crazy. And you got women apologizing to the agents. I'm so sorry. I forgot my mascara and my lipstick. And the Fourth Amendment says if you're going to search, you're not only going to have a warrant, you're going to say specifically what you're looking for. But, but, but it's not specific. It's liquids. It's lipstick. It could be shoes. It could be... Breaking the will of the people. The real purpose of body scanners. And you scroll down, it shows the Nazis and others strip searching women in World War II. I tell you what I would do personally. I would just take uh, photographs of all the mass graves of World War II and the Soviet Union, of all the naked bodies, and have big placards of that. And Genius! And saying, we're not going to end up like this. No, thank you. Great idea, pointing out that they always strip you down before they kill you. I mean, it's a real act of submission. Do you agree with me that this telling ev everyone you will be naked body scanned is a key point in our conditioning and we must resist it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's an ongoing process of the uh, personalization, dehumanization, and getting the public to accept the fact you're nothing but cattle. Once you're on the plane, you're coming into Detroit, what happens next? The pilot comes on, 
the speaker, and, and he says we have 10 minutes to landing. Flight crew, take your seats and buckle up. A, uh, a flight attendant walks by my seat, mumbling to herself, something smells like smoke. I looked up. Uh, I'm in row 27. Uh, I could see smoke coming from row 19, eight rows up. Uh, it looked, it wasn't a lot of smoke at that time. It, it looked like it was coming from the floor. So I, uh, I unbuckled my seatbelt, took a few steps up the aisle to get a better look, and, uh, and then it burst into flames across the floor of the seats and up the wall to the ceiling. When it burst into flames, people were screaming, fire, fire, uh, terrorists, water, 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 we need water, somebody get water. Uh, flight attendants were screaming. The pilot comes on the intercom and says emergency landing and starts speeding up. And while this is going on, the, the terrorist man's being hauled off into the first class area by a couple passengers. We are five days into this and we've not seen any surveillance footage. The media doesn't seem concerned about uh, eyewitnesses seeing a man videotaping the whole flight aimed at this guy. When we first took off, I noticed about 10 seats ahead of us to the left-hand side. He uh, had a camcorder and I didn't think much of it. I thought maybe this was his first flight and was just excited. And then when the actual incident occurred, I looked up and he was the only one standing and filming the entire thing. That's obviously an accomplice or a handler or something. Uh, we've got this other guy getting him through security. I mean, any other comments? When we were being detained in Detroit, we were held uh, in an area of a, of a baggage claim area. Then all the passengers from our flight, there was nobody uh, except for some law enforcement personnel. After we had been there for about an hour, all the time with our carry-on bags, three bomb-sniffing dogs were brought in. One of them sat down by the bag that was brought in by a the man in orange. He had an orange. He appeared to be of Indian or Pakistani or some similar descent, maybe around age 30. He was walked back to a room, not in handcuffs. Uh, he went in the door. He was in there approximately an hour. When he came out, he was handcuffed, taken away. A, an FBI officer came up to the group of the rest of us passengers and said the following, which is not exact, but close. You're being moved to another area. It's not safe here. I'm sure all of you saw what just happened and can figure out why you're being moved. We were taken to a customs area and uh, they brought bomb dogs and uh, checked all the luggage with that. Uh, another person was taken aside and handcuffed and brought out uh, and we were moved into another room for safety reasons they told us. My story on this has been the same all along and uh, the FBI now has five versions of their story, which I clearly lay out with the time period and with each version, and they're just not, they're not credible. There is absolutely no excuse for the reason why, number one, we were left on the plane for 20 minutes, not knowing if there was another bomb there. Number two, security allowing us to take our carry-on bags off the plane, and we stood there with all of our bags together, for an hour until the bomb sniffing dogs arrive. Uh, and then, you know, after they found one, well, then we're moved to another area and now they don't want to talk about the man who was taken away. You were there, they didn't stop him for immigration violations. The dog went over and sat down in front of his bag, the alert right. for explosives. Right, exactly. Unless this is a passport sniffing dog. Uh, this is a huge story, one of the biggest out there. The FBI is on this full time. They know what's going on. Why are they being dishonest? And, and, and how do we investigate this when the investigators themselves are engaged in clear obstruction of the truth? You know, I don't know how else to take it. It's either utter incompetence or intentionally hiding something, you know, and I don't know how to take it. And still, we're now, what, eight, nine days into this, and we still haven't seen the Amsterdam footage. Well, and also, why aren't we seeing the video of when he's going through uh, metal detector, passport check, you know, and boarding? You know, this is a modern airport. You'd think they would have video of all this of some sort. They didn't say, oh, we'll look at that. They just said, no, there was no one helping him, which is very suspicious instead of just putting the footage out. If somebody robs a bank or holds up a gas station, well, there's video footage of the, the incident on the 11 o'clock news, usually that very night. If I'm not correct, well, show the video. What are you hiding?
Well, now, Sunday, it came out, what, five days ago, six days ago, authorities were watching different Nigerian on Christmas Day flights, CNN. What a way to take a huge issue and just kind of put it out there like it's milk toast. Okay, there was somebody else. Yeah, they did arrest him, but we're not going to talk about it. Kurt, there's a definite cover-up, and you've been vindicated in triplicate. Not only that, but I don't know if you caught the ABC News article that came out over the weekend. Uh, there were a couple sentences knock at the bottom of this article about female suicide bombers. I don't know if you caught this. No, no, tell us. I'll read it to you word for word. Federal agents also tell ABC News they're attempting to identify a man who passengers said helped Abdul Mutalab change planes for Detroit when he landed in Amsterdam from Lagos, Nigeria. Authorities had initially discounted the passenger accounts but the agents say there is a growing belief the man may have played a role to make sure Abdul Mutalab did not get cold feet. Oh my God, you've been vindicated by them on that. But obviously they, they think the trail's cold now. They have all the surveillance footage. They were involved in a cover-up. Kurt, this is huge. Well, that, that was my take on it, but unfortunately for ABC News, they buried it in the bottom of a seemingly unrelated article about female suicide bombers heading here from Yemen. Why is this not front page news everywhere, number one? Number two, why are you burying at the bottom of this article? Number three, why did you initially discount my story to begin with? It's not like I'm not credible here. And of course, they had COINTELPRO posing as the Patriot Movement attacking you. Uh, all the usual suspects. I mean, it never ends, Kurt. We are, of course, going to get into the top story today. In plain view, as if it's no big deal, DetroitNews.com. Okay, it was a U.S. government agent that was the smart-dressed man that led Umar Farouk Alamatab, or the underwear bomber, on to the aircraft in Amsterdam. After a month plus of lying and saying that that no such man existed and saying no one else was pulled off the plane in Detroit supposedly with a bomb now they've admitted that happened as well Kurt Haskell the lawyer and his lawyer wife uh, they've both on record have been proven right with other witnesses and you add how they were already getting in Yemen that's now confirmed Washington Post they were planning to already launch a bigger attack 2,000 troops there and then right on time right as the body scanners were scheduled to go in in January nationwide. That was already scheduled, folks. They're, they're saying on the news, oh, now we're doing this. So now I went and looked it up. They were scheduled to go in the additional 214 airports. They were in less than 20. So although we have acquired these machines, they are not as widely deployed as they should be. In your current role as a consultant, do you have an interest in body scanners? I, you know, I, to be, we consult with all kinds of firms, including firms that do manufacture body scanners. You do have some some interest in, uh, in, in, in more sales of body scanners. Uh. As well as a lot of other security measures. But I would point out that I've talked about this for probably the last three years. Read what the scanners do to your body. And the TSA guys, again, you need to know why you're going to be dying in five years of cancer. Go ahead. And then we find this uh, article about terahertz waves, which is what they use to do this scanner. Uh, this came in today. and. According to one of their studies, I'm just going to read this real quick, terahertz waves are in the electromagnetic spectrum between microwaves and infrared, and uh, they pass through non-conductive materials such as clothes, paper, wood, and brick. They say the forces that are generated by these THZ fields are tiny and resonant effects that allow the THZ waves to unzip double-stranded DNA, creating bubbles in the strand that could significantly interfere with processes such as gene expression and DNA replication. So step in the microwave. And of course, the fools don't know that the reports you pulled up and I've looked at, it, these things are leaking. But the TSA guys are going to love dying of cancer. Oh, yeah. This They're is fun. Surrounding it. They're all around it. The, the thing's right there. Right well, see, that's kind of the good thing, though. See, evil always gets judged. These guys make excuses. They're going to make excuses about scanning naked children, scanning naked women and men. They're going to make excuses about how it doesn't hurt you. They're the ones that are going to die first. Oh, yeah. Eight hours a day standing around it. And yeah. I'm sad for them, but this is what they want. This is what they get. This is a test of the emergency alert system. 
Let's go ahead and play the clergy response team clip. Now, remember, before this became national uh, uh, news, we got the secret documents from pastors who've been recruited by FEMA. We posted the secret documents with FEMA phone numbers. Train your flocks to turn their guns in. Train your flocks to go to FEMA camps. Train your flocks to take forced inoculations. People didn't believe us, just like they didn't believe the MIAC report. Then, suddenly, local news began reporting it, but like it was a good thing. Now, listen, will martial law ever be a reality? And the preachers are there being paid by the government, faith-based initiative now continuing under Obama, to tell their flocks to do what they're told by the authorities, and the government's biggest threat is the American people. That's a quote. So this is specifically the pastors getting ready for us to go to FEMA camps. And there's thousands of pieces of evidence like this, and Glenn Beck saying it doesn't exist. Here it is. Law ever become a reality in America? Some fear any nuclear, biological, or chemical attack on U.S. territory might trigger just that. And as KSLA News 12's Jeff Farrell discovered, the clergy would help the government with potentially their biggest problem, us. From my cold, dead hands. Charlton Heston's famous declaration captures a truly American value, the overarching desire to protect our freedoms. But gun confiscation is exactly what happened during the state of emergency following Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. U.S. troops also arrived, something far easier to do even now thanks to last year's elimination of the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act. That forbid U.S. troops from policing on American soil. If martial law were enacted here at home, like depicted in the movie The Siege, easing public fears and quelling dissent would be critical. And that's exactly what the clergy response team, as it's called, helped accomplish in New Orleans. Uh, Jeff, the primary thing that we say to anybody is let's cooperate and get this thing over with, and then we'll settle the differences once the crisis is over. Such clergy response teams would walk a tightrope between the needs of the government versus the wishes of the public. In a lot of cases, these clergy would already be known in the neighborhoods in which they're helping to defuse that situation. For the clergy, one of the biggest tools that they will have in helping calm the public down or obey the law is the Bible itself, specifically Romans, Romans 13. Because the government is established by the Lord, you know, and, uh, and that's what we believe in the Christian faith. That's what's stated in the scripture. Civil rights advocates believe the amount of public cooperation may depend largely on how long they expect a suspension of their rights might last. And see, here is Mother Jones. Should Obama control the Internet? It says right here, Senator John Rockefeller, goes by Jay Rockefeller, has announced they need to end the Internet, that it's bad, and that private companies will have government hubs tied into them to snoop on everyone without warrants and to be able to shut down the web instantly. See, right now the government has to get warrants and go out and seize all the hubs. Here's another one. America's secret police intelligence experts warn the proposal to merge two Pentagon intelligence units could create an ominous new agency. And the head of cybersecurity just resigned three weeks ago saying the Pentagon and Homeland Security are taking over the Internet and it's a threat to freedom in America. So their own guys quitting, saying this takeover is happening. All the radio and TV in the nation under the emergency alert system in 96, under a federal law and executive order, FEMA is wired into the transmitters themselves and cable to take over all the systems and broadcast anytime they want. Before the stations would tune to a signal themselves. Now that's out of their hands. Uh, all of that's going on. So, so see... They've got the preachers, they've got the citizens, they've got the uh, military prepared for martial law, and they can remotely listen to you even when the cell phone's off. That standardized the cell phones, and all telecommunications companies were given $9 billion total to put in whole floors for the NSA to move into. So the NSA doesn't tap the phone companies, they are the phone companies. Just like FEMA on all radio, TV, cable, you name it, is already in control with hubs at the transmitter site or at the satellite uplink site, the last piece of equipment. This is in my film, Police State 2000, by the way. See, I was sitting there talking to the engineer in 1996 at KJFK FM, and he calls me over and goes, look at this, Alex. They're ordering us to do this. Here's all the secret documents. We're not supposed to show this to anybody. And I was sitting there reading it. FEMA takes over through this. Everything you do goes through this system. I mean... That's what you hear when it goes, bang, bang, bang. You know, this has been an emergency alert system. That is a federal test tone 
going via shortwave radio transmitters, dials in, and takes control of your radio station. And that's what they say right here. During emergencies, when they're rounding people up and arresting them and shooting people, their job is to keep the media shut down. They don't have to come arrest Alex Jones. They hit one button, the Internet shuts off. They hit one button, T... In the not-too-distant future, a self-proclaimed intellectual elite will rule every aspect of our lives. Many people in the world are content to stay as first or second level magnets. The economy is emerging from the recession. We have to keep geoengineering on the Implementation table. Implementation depends on motivation. An alarming and possibly catastrophic disaster... Already the path has been chosen. The design set in motion decades ago. Their endgame... Complete control. Water. Air. The economy, population, and even human logistics will all fall within their purview. The goal to acquire all the natural resources of the planet and bring them securely under government control. All activities of mankind will be monitored, accounted for, and controlled. Legislation pretending to address concerns about the environment national security and financial stability will in fact be used to erode the very foundations of liberty and to enslave the population this will all happen in the name of security and progress alluding to the notion that this is all for our protection this will not miraculously occur overnight with the sudden proclamation of martial law it has been happening incrementally for at least half a century Every law enacted that truncates the Bill of Rights in the name of national security is another nail in our coffin. Through this type of increasingly invasive legislation, the systematic decay of constitutional law becomes inevitable. Thousands of years of building and rebuilding, creating and recreating so you can let it come the dust. Leaving our essential rights neutered and impotent, the Bill of Rights is reduced to a quaint antique, collecting dust in a library somewhere, retaining all the potency of a fairy tale. Martial law, called a more politically neutral cash phrase, is practiced with an iron fist. The implosion of the economy has begun by design. The United States dollar is under attack and losing value every day. While the cost of living continues to skyrocket, New laws that will effectively double taxes are already on the books and ready to be implemented. Nothing has been introduced to help homeowners with their now default loans. But at the same time, money is generously given to bankers who give themselves huge bonuses. During one of the worst economic downturns in history and dry up loans to small businesses. All the while, the economy spirals downward at a fall rate. As the citizens of the United States lose their ability to take care of themselves, the government conveniently steps in to save the day. Capitalism gives way to socialism, and then without much notice, into the neo-dark ages of the one world government total dictatorship. Once this task has been completed and the control grid is firmly in place, they can play their final drunk card. FEMA counts. And by design, we will welcome the salvation with open arms, as any alternative will surely seem like suicide. Once we've been properly enslaved, they gain control over the rest of Earth's natural resources. Humanity. America, here's what you need to know tonight. I'm, you know, basically a rodeo clown. If you have any kind of fear that we might be headed towards a totalitarian state, look FEMA out. trailers, FEMA prisons, FEMA camps. I want proof. If they exist, I want pictures. I lost sleep last night worrying about this story, thinking about this story. But when I see, you know, 9-11 victim family on television or whatever, I'm just like, oh, shut Well, up. yesterday we talked about debunking conspiracy theories. The only thing that I answer to is myself. And I just want to be able to look at myself in the mirror and also sleep at night. Glenn Beck, a year and a half ago, said that Ron Paul supporters should be arrested and that the army should be used against them, and that they were dangerous terrorists. Yeah, I'm to keep your eyes open. 
it, but I know it's probably like impossible. <laughs> Or that's what I'd have you believe. You know, it took me about a year to start hating the 9-11 victims' families. I don't hate all of them. I hate about probably about 10 of them. Any of these 9-11 truthers who I've been telling you for years are dangerous. Guy Fox. This guy was a, a British uh, terrorist who tried to overthrow the government by blowing up Parliament and killing everybody in it. Paul's supporters called the donations, and I'm quoting, a money bomb. It's really not the way I would go, you know, tying my movement in with a historical terrorist attack. You're right. Uh, there's a, a strain of isolationism and anarchy in the American tradition, which uh, Ron Paul is tapping into. Uh, I think it's very significant that he chose Guy Fox. Uh, there are plenty of, unfortunately, libertarian websites which are indistinguishable from the anti-American left these days. Yeah. So, totally in bed with the Islamo-fascists um, and have turned against this country. Turned against this country. This country. This country. Where am I wrong? The Ron Paul Revolution. I think it's meant to be a catchy slogan, but I fear some of his fringe supporters are taking the word revolution too literally. What Glenn Beck is saying is a talking point being given out to the media. Then this is going to drive the, the conspiracy theorists let the crazy about me. I have this. They're making me say this. Help. Because we were seeing Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity say it. We were seeing CNN hosts say it. We were seeing Joe Scarborough say it. And I said, that's a talking point. And then suddenly he started saying a few months ago, I'm going to expose the FEMA camps. If these things exist, that's bad, and we will cover it. If they don't exist, it's irresponsible to not debunk this story. We have an independent group on this program looking into it, turning over every stone. I am going to bring you this story. He announced a few weeks ago, I'm going to have Popular Mechanics, the yellow journalist, uh, on to debunk all of this. So I asked James from Popular Mechanics to do an investigation on several projects. The first one is the FEMA camp. Yes, and so we put a reporter on this, and what's so interesting here, we, we're, we're, we're waiting to really do a definitive deep dig on this. We don't right. like to just come out and say, oh, we've debunked it, you know, after we've looked at it for two right. days. And how is Glenn Beck debunking it? I had predicted tonight, we'll see if I'm right, that he will do a straw man and focus on the websites that are getting it wrong. And what we did was we looked into these claims. You know, you can't go and visit every one of the 600 sites that some of these sure. conspiracy theorists claim. So we started looking at the ones that are most popular the on biggest. the Internet. And I said, well, look out, folks. He's just trying to get your confidence to then discredit it later. We mailed letters to Glenn Beck. I know people that work in his office. I contacted him and I said, here's the proof. If he wants it, we stand by to work with Mr. Beck. If he isn't going to come out next week and say arrest all of us, basically, like he was doing a year ago. First of all, I, on the FEMA prison thing, I know we've been in contact with your office and we would appreciate any help that you have. I want to make sure we're turning over every stone on anything because there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of crazy stuff that is being said about these things. And Beck says he's been doing months of research and they've been having trouble finding it. He's doing research. He can't ever bring any facts. And he makes little jokes about, ooh, the government's going to get me or, oh, I'm being censored on Fox and calls us conspiracy theorists. And I'm predicting Lynn Beck is going to attack us this way. They're going to show the 1990s video of the closed down Amtrak train system up by Chicago. So we started looking at the ones that are most popular the on biggest. the Internet. Okay. And let's show the video. First, show me the video that is on the Internet. This is uh, one of the so-called, I guess, a death camp. This is something where they're showing uh, a, a so-called concentration camp. These are turnstiles. Uh, this is in a secure behind the, the, the fence. I don't know how they got this video when it was behind the fence, but they went in and got this video. Like so many of these things, the truth is actually fairly evident. This is an Amtrak repair facility in Beach Grove, Indiana. The, uh, the, the woman who made this video initially claims that it's some kind of American Auschwitz and they've outfitted buildings with gas and they've got these strange turnstiles. In fact, it's, um, it is a repair facility. They're going to do that. And then what they're going to do is they're going to show the photos that are all over the web 
uh, in Mississippi and Louisiana of mock Bosnia-Herzegovina slash Kosovo training camps, because the signs are in that you know Slavic language, where it has machine gun nests, checkpoints, barbed wire as a refugee camp, and they send the troops through for drills. Um, show me the uh, pictures of, uh, I think this is Camp Grayling. Do we have the picture of the watchtowers? This is pretty spooky. This is where Americans are currently being held, I believe they're saying. Well, people say all kinds of things, and these pictures have been floating around the Internet for more than 10 years. Okay. In fact, Camp Grayling is the largest natural, National Guard training facility in the U.S. They train Army, Navy, Marines, and uh, one of the groups they train is military police. And in fact, one of the, th the functions they train them for is handling prisoners of war in uh, a battle zone like Iraq. And they're going to say, see, people said this was a camp. It's not really a camp. It's a place where they're doing drills. Oh, see, this is really just an Amtrak train track. We went out there, and yeah, it's got barbed bar wire facing in, but it's not really a camp. Do we have the video with audio? Because if we don't, I don't really care. Um, the video with the audio about the, the boarded up buildings with the gas chambers. Do you have that? In yet another fenced area, we see a large warehouse building at the end with the electronic turnstiles in front of it. Okay. That they were putting gas heaters of some sort in there. Right, and what we found out is, uh, first of all, one of those buildings has been knocked down. The other ones were upgraded. Their heating system was obsolete, and more than 15 years ago. What am I predicting Glenn Beck's going to do tonight? What have I been predicting for weeks he's going to do? He is going to come out and say, look at this. This is just a regular prison, and they're taking photos of it and saying it's a camp. Oh, look at this. There's a kernel of truth. They have introduced a bill for during emergencies to have FEMA places for folks to go. I mean, they've got to do that, you know, like Katrina. Oh, look at this. This is an Army training facility for a refugee camp simulation. Oh, look at what they... I mean, I know how they operate. I know how Popular Mechanics operates. I mean, I was right about Glenn Beck setting you up when he said he was going to expose the FEMA camps, and I said, you watch, he's going to debunk them. Well, trains, I believe Auschwitz had trains. I'm just saying, Jim. Well, once you go down that road, you can't yeah. really, if somebody wants to be convinced of that, you can't really debunk that. I understand these people because he reads off a script, ladies and gentlemen. I know the sheet of music he's singing off of. I know the next line in the, in the, in the chorus. This stuff is scripted. So the establishment comes out and mixes some truth about FEMA camps and things, but then makes jokes about it, mixing it in with patriots and gun owners are dangerous. He's currently doing that. And the people get, some of them get fooled by that. I challenge Glenn Beck. You claim you've been doing research for weeks on this and you can't sleep. Okay, buddy. Everybody's going to email you, your radio show and Fox News, the last 45-minute piece we've done. Your little staffers can watch that, and everything there can be Googled, pulled up from government documents at the army.mil and FBI and everywhere else, and then you'll have a clear picture of what's being set up and how they now have to orchestrate an economic collapse to get us to accept this as society breaks down. If uh, Glenn Beck wants to know if the FEMA camps are real or not, all he has to do is go to the Army War College, the army.mil website, the Army Times, and they say, and it's been all over the Phoenix newspapers. The police say they're ready to work with the military against the people. That their new mission is fighting the American people physically. Chaos is hanging around. Put your ear to the ground. And shut up from the sound. The death machine ain't slowing down. It's gaining pound for pound. A gas man. Cause the couture in the summer of rage The building mass graves within the states You and I, they'll vaccinate They're preparing us for an all-out police state
They state that Congress has no authority during emergencies and the president's basically absolute dictator. When Congress wanted to see the detailed documents, they were told you're not allowed to international security. When Congress is co-equal to the president, that is dictatorship. Let's go.